Hello. I'm just taking my walk and decide this will be the first. Uh, what's the word? It's gonna be the first little just general purpose talking, probably about the latest Sub Zero chapter. A little windy out today, but that's why I'm outside mostly. Well, I'm always outside. But. Uh, let's see. I'll probably just talk about anything ranging from a F Zero to Angler Ice, maybe just the pictures, maybe not even story related stuff. I might just start talking about, uh, I don't know, it's anything really. I think I'll mostly talk about story related stuff. Probably talk about what I think makes a good story and all that. Just gonna walk around my usual place. Right now I'm kind of near the football field. I'm going to go to the forest. We'll just talk from there. So anyways, I think the last... Ch yeah, at the time of this posting, I think... So the last chapter was, um... Lap 38. Earl and Chia are... Captured in Magica. In Princeas. 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 Uh, I don't know. They're locked up in her uh, prison at her espionage charges. As they were working with Joey Summer and Lieutenant Sapuku to get the planet of Magica in the Galactic Federation, kind of like the United Nations in real life. So they were working on getting them in Mysteria, and Magica's the only planet, I believe, in the story that aren't part of the. Well, I shouldn't say only. I've only mentioned the ones that aren't in the United Powers, or Galactic Federation. So the plan is that she and Earl are supposed to simply go... Can you pretend Chia was supposed to represent the Hyrus to Mysteria, since the Queen there is ill, which I'll expand on later. And Earl is simply supposed to go at playing as her husband joke being he was the Earl. British term. But, um, which is almost, it was almost a little obvious, but things don't exactly go as planned. And they were kind of caught after Earl requested a glass of alcohol from Princia. And she claims in the end, after aiming a gun at Chia, that the legal drinking age on Mysteria is 30. Therefore, she thought Earl wasn't from Mysteria, and then immediately started assuming that neither was Chia. She didn't know who they were at first, but... Uh, well, the other thing is, Seppuku, he was doing his own, his whole own thing, really. I mean, he, uh, I believe what I intended was that his plan was he wanted actually, he didn't care about Jody's side of it, not at all. In fact, he kind of, he's kind of one of the reasons the plan fell apart anyways. But his, he simply wanted to, well, let's get something straight. His computer in Mute City, that's supposed to be like a, something more, like a master computer can access more than the average one, probably from the Federation or something. And he didn't have any information on the isolated planets. He doesn't have any on Mysteria either. Both planets, Magicka and Mysteria, has no background or information on. So he wanted to get some. I don't know why. As I climbed, he, um, he told the guy, the guard, he disarmed and was taken hostage that he wanted it so he could design better F-Zero parts. So it would benefit only Chia and Seppuku basically if they got these really good F-Zero parts. And um, I guess what I mean there is, I don't remember, uh, I honestly never really cared about the AX characters in f so I can't tell you off the bat what um, the Spark Moons things are, or it's rankings, or whatever it's called, but, um, I guess technically the general thinking would have been Shapuku got that, uh, blueprint to make these parts. He could probably just replicate, and, um, wait, 
Oh, I remember. As I recall in the little uh, F-Zero lore, it says that the Spark Moon's pretty much the same as the Blue Falcon. So the general thinking was, if he gets the blueprints to make these parts, then he'll just, you know, make the Red Dove and a Fur and Kitten equivalent to the Blue Falcon. I mean, you already allied of Captain Falcon, you might as well have the exact same machine as him, and you're an unstoppable machine. No way you'll be able to stop them. Be an easy win for Chia or Sifuku. Chia, who's not quite up there in the Grand Prix right now, but things may change. Um, where was I? Ah. So Sifuku was out stealing these information. He went and found this computer in the library, and after the guard told him that this was it, kind of just transferred all the data. And I guess the general assumption is that he would then put it inside his computer. Therefore, he'd have all files that the uh, <coughs> magic and government had stored. So then he can access pretty much all that from his base. But, while he did get the information, things didn't quite go as planned. He got chased out of the library, and he rudely, well not rudely, I guess, if he uh, survived, but then runs right into the dining room, jumps on the table, knocks over some food, and at this point Chia and Earl were already at gunpoint, but, you know, at the least, Sapuka could you know, just pulled out his gun and started, like, blasting everyone away, and, you know, not complaining about my own ride, I'm just saying, Sapuka's kind of a narschlock, because he could have just probably shot Prince Chia, grabbed Chia and Earl, run, get back to the ship, Given, he was being chased by soldiers. I mean, guards. I guess soldiers. Boy, I mean, he could have tried. So, anyways, that's um, pretty much the end of class 37. That uh, she and Earl are taken captive and put in a little prison area. <laughs> and chill app 38 opens then with Chia and Earl in a very dark scene. And I made a, well, hold on. They're in a very dark scene. They're just sitting on the floor in the prison cell alone. I depicted the, I, I mean, I didn't draw really explain. I guess that was bad on my part, but I guess, um, the prison cell's supposed to be like, it was supposed to have, um, Fairly nothing in it. I didn't picture any beds or anything. Yet there was a bathroom, restroom. I don't think, I'm not sure, I don't know what a prison looks like. I kind of assume that a prison in life has restrooms, but then again, I, I don't know. I think, don't prisoners. Okay, never mind. <laughs> So, yeah, they have their own restroom and stuff. Chia and Earl's just kind of sitting there for hours now. It's now the evening. When they were supposed to get home, as Chia mentioned, because the original plan was they just have dinners, try and sway Prince Chia, simply leave back from Mute City. Pretty simple. Should have went right. Instead, it's now evening. They're still in the prison. Nothing's really happened. Nobody's told them anything. No interrogations. Just kind of locked them in there and... Nothing more was said. This is like the best drink I ever had. No joke. I just got this today. And it's so, um, yeah. So they're just sitting on the floor, kind of moaning, mourning, and uh, wondering when Prince is finally gonna come and tell them what their fate will be. Both kind of have different ideas of what might happen. Earl's kind of thinking maybe execution, but he doesn't think so quite. I mean, as he said, all they really did was kind of have free dinner. I mean, they didn't kill it. Well, Sapuku kind of butchered up someone, but I mean, <laughs> not really butchered. But, I mean, right now, all Chia and Earl did, they just kind of sat around and ate some food and, and got caught, so I don't think... I don't think that should be execution, which is what uh, Chia Earl thought as his defense is that would be 
very Stalin-like to do. So, um, Chia and Earl then, they kind of keep having their little emotion box. Earl at first is feeling guilty, saying that it was his lust for beer that got them in the situation. Chia, though, she, I mean, she thinks, she kind of believes that, I suppose, that, because it kind of, he had no way of knowing, I guess. You really can't blame Earl for what happened. I mean, it's kind of cruel if you did. Sure, yeah, I mean, he did, it was him that got him put in there. And maybe they were pretty close. Princey, it did sound somewhat amused when he was bringing up the Federation before, so just maybe if it wasn't for that damn beer alcohol. Perhaps they would have got away with it, but anyways, Chia just kind of keeps reassuring her, him, no, no, it wasn't you, it was, uh, it was Jody and Sapuku's fault, yeah. Obviously, Earl's not amused by that answer, though. The uh, two then, uh, Excuse me, I can't remember, I'm trying to think. Well, the two, um... They just kind of keep talking. They continue to talk, and... I think the conversation is... I don't remember what happens after the drinking one. They... I know for a while they just talk kind of emotionally. Eventually the subject kind of changes and goes somewhere kind of strange and sexual. Um, it all starts Chia simply because the kind of recurring thing in the past two chapters was that she was having trouble with these heels that she was wearing, which is a... Uh, you picture like Princess Peach or... You know, honestly, I don't even think they're heels. I don't know what she wears. Anyways, yeah, heels. I just kept saying she didn't like her heels. She couldn't walk in them. She never wore any before. They weren't fitting well. So she is kind of sitting there. She starts complaining about how her feet's going to be swollen and stuff. Earl then offers a foot massage. And she uh, is very quick to respond, simply saying, hell no. Earl's a little confused. He thinks girls, you know, would like foot massages. Uh, that's more I get across to the audience that Chia is self-conscious about her feet, and that's, um, Chia is based off of me, really, so it's a girl version of me. I'm self-conscious about my feet, so that's kind of where I got that from. So, no, she says she does not like people seeing her feet, she doesn't like going barefoot anywhere and all that. Well, I didn't have her say that, but that's what I think. I'm very anti-sandals, I've never worn any, never will. I always wear boots and all such. She's probably a little better about that, though, than me, because I don't like going to the beach even, and she, a few times, went swimming and stuff, I guess. Anyways, that kind of gets, now what kind of goes weird with that is when uh, she immediately, she makes kind of a random comment, I'll admit. It was just kind of a way of transiting, transitioning into the, uh, well, okay, well. She just kind of brings out, I'd sooner let you give me a breast massage than a foot massage. Aunt Earl's a little, uh, huh? And he's just kind of thinking this is a little weird because a foot massage should be a kind of a casual thing. But a breast massage being even, uh, he found that kind of weird though because, um, I mean, I kind of, he kind of, he kind of read that message differently. He kind of thought, well, a foot massage is usually normal enough. Are you saying a breast massage is even more normal to you? Kind of, he didn't say that, but that's kind of what he was thinking right away. 
so just because I'm that guy, she doesn't kind of stakes. Oh, well, me and my sister gave each other breast massages all the time. And That's kind of the, uh, another thing I brought up in the uh, chapter of the onsen is that she is very, wait. Yeah, that chapter. She had kind of a, uh, she's comfortable, she, I guess it was normal for her to kind of get naked with her sister and not sexual things, but... Like I think before she said they showered and sometimes shaved each other. And I'm saying shaved, I mean, you know. Legs and pubic areas. So, and I have to throw in a little, uh, after she mentions that they give each other breast massages, I, I just thought, uh, I'll go ahead and just put a little dirty thing in there. I, you know, I made Earl immediately ask how old Abby was because he was a little interested. And then she tells her, him that she was 12, and he's kind of like, yeah, I don't know, he probably thought she was, like, around her age, so it would be kind of sexy. But then he realizes <laughs> Abby's, no, she wasn't even 13 yet, so that, would, that wouldn't that would be a very healthy thing for Earl to picture. She then kind of explains how that would work and everything, but um, what gets a little awkward is when she then actually, wait, she actually offers it to Earl, kind of, no, not like flat out, hey, want to give you a breast massage? Uh, no, she's, I think she just kind of slowly starts going, like, if I recall, she kind of started going, like, you know, if things are going bad and we are probably going to die, then maybe we should both do something we would enjoy. And that was kind of her thing, uh, transitioning it to that, she said, that we would enjoy. She would enjoy the pleasure, Earl, probably, I mean... Yeah, so, <laughs> surprisingly, Earl doesn't necessarily uh, decline the offer, but he, nor does he really accept it, but he kind of intended that he said yes, because he, he didn't really say yes, but he started kind of asking more questions, like, what would I do? Gee, then kind of. Sorry, I'm talking about freaking breast massages and all that, but, uh... <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Chia kind of is strict on the idea. Says, you know, you could, uh... Anywhere on your breasts you could kind of massage. But she was strict at not... Though I didn't say the term nipples. She said, not the nipples. She said, if you touched her nipples, then she would... Slap him so hard across the cheek he would need a transplant, I believe I said. So. That went by. I think, um... You know, I don't remember what happened after that. Honestly. I think it might, that might have been when Princia came in, so I'm just going to jump to that. So anyways, they're talking, but I think Earl says something, but he's interrupted as Princia finally shows up, her first two words being Chia Flower. So Earl and Chia are a little shocked that she figured it out. She clearly now knows who Chia actually is. She's not, sorry, she's not the queen, I mean, not the hire. She's just a racer. And she starts explaining to Earl and Chia how she figured it out. And she kind of says, oh, I was a little boneheaded. I mean, <sighs> okay, so, you know, a typical thing happened. Uh, I was just talking about the part where Princia finds, or exp starts explaining how she knew who Chia was, and wouldn't you know it, the batteries run out. Didn't know. So I got all the way up to the part where, well, it happens. I'm sure it's happened to everybody in the films. Yeah. 
So let me repeat myself. And this time we're not going too far slow because of all this. I've only been gone for about 20 minutes, but for some reason. Well, for one, you can probably tell a breeze kind of picked up for some reason, which I like, but not for the camera. That's probably annoying on your part. We're just going to go to the... We're just going to walk around the track, I guess, unless somebody else comes and we'll leave somewhere else. But I don't know why the forest is kind of being annexed by people. And I like talking about privacy, especially since this is a chapter very kind of kind of sexual themed. So I mean, I did have time to go back home and review what I did have recorded. So I'll see if I can hold my camera differently now. I don't know how far away I should do it. I should be back here, not here, probably. Probably around here. Okay, so let me continue finally, I think. Okay. Actually, I'm going to do that. Okay. Anyways, continuing off from where I believe I was at, Princia came and they were asking how she figured it out. She just said, I was a little surprised that I didn't figure it out earlier because it was kind of obvious in the end. I mean, she mentioned the part, you know, she is defending. Well, okay, when the topic of Chia Flower came up in the last race, uh, Princia called Chia a klutz. Not, she was saying the race, or Chia was a klutz that race. And she doesn't know, obviously, that this person she's having dinner with is Chia. So, you know, and Chia's taking offense to this naturally, defends her. Princia states that this should have been one of the biggest hints because she was taking such offense to the term klutz and everything, so it should have almost been a little obvious that this is Chia, but that's not quite enough evidence. The other thing she said that went wrong was when Chia and Earl were talking about the baby name. At one point, Earl accidentally just yelled them. Um, we're not naming our baby, we're not naming our child Chocolate Chia, but she said, um, he said Chia out loud in accident, so. That's what Princia said she was a little surprised she didn't catch on right away, because Earl literally called her Chia right in front of her. And Princia goes on a little about how they just have similar facial features and stuff, so. Anyways. They obviously ask what their fate's gonna be. And Princia's not, I'm not depicting, don't get me wrong, because I don't know her character. She wasn't in the anime at all or anything, so I can't tell you what her personality's like. So she's basically not, not my character, but I designed her in my own way. So I depicted her in my vision, not as some like evil person. She, more like Samurai Goro, probably. She just, trying to make a quick buck, so she decides she's not going to kill them. She's just going to put them up on the market like slaves, sort of. Not slaves, just so offer them on the market. She tells them what's shocking, of course, and you can probably imagine why if you read the other chapters. Uh, she informs she informs them that the only person bidding on her is same for Chia, she's being, she had Brian Blaskowitz is leading on her too, so both are a little appalled, like, uh, well, Chia, the first thing she says, she just starts panicking and saying elbows, knees, referring to the second punishment she was supposed to get, where they would cut off her elbows and knees. She is still pretty demoralized by that. If you look at the picture I made, depicting that, um, chapter where she was tortured, you can obviously tell she took quite a few deep cuts on her arms and legs, so she's pretty traumatized. Earl begs her that, I mean, okay, well, first of all, this Princey mentions, while well, Earl's only being bedded on by Brock Lasko, it's she as being, um, bedded on more, I think, one being Samurai Goro, and many others being picked from the red light district of Port Town. 
don't know if I'll expand to that ever, I might. Um, see, this is where I get across that Princey is not necessarily evil, because if she was evil, she would have just... Well, okay, what happens is Earl simply just asks her, please don't sell, I mean, he says, sell us to anybody else but not Brock Blaskovitz, please. And, you know, he goes on about how Chia was so treacherously tortured by him. Britzia understands, actually, so that's, that's not like, you know, your typical villain. She didn't just laugh and go like, ha, ha, ha. Oh, I don't care, as long as I'm getting my money. Now she kind of was understanding. She said, okay, I'll tell Brock Blaskowitz that he's not getting his hands on you guys. And she simply kind of just said, I'll try taking the bit off, and, you know, like Samurai Gora will be the next highest bidder for Chia, but Brock Blaskowitz won't get to take part in it. So, Earl and Chia were kind of surprised that Prince uh, wasn't, I mean, she, she wasn't evil, she just was trying to make some money, but she also had, you know, basic morals. She knew, hey, she, he, he was right, though. Brock probably would just take them both and torture them again, maybe probably kill them. I mean, all, the only person that could save them at that point would have been Seppuku, but he, he probably wouldn't have even known where Black Shadow is, so. Wouldn't have worked. Anyways. Princia soon leaves after calling Earl kind of cute, and the two then uh, return, I guess, to sitting for a few hours. A few hours later, though, when stuff really starts, uh, starts getting a little uh, interesting. Because. Next time you see Chia and Earl just switches over to a few hours later, so a few hours later, they're obviously both kind of, Earl and Chia are both kind of nervous or, you know, they have to wonder if it's the last time, of course, they'll see each other. Because they never said exactly that Brack Blaskovitz wouldn't get her. Princess said she'd try. But, I don't know. So... They were a little concerned, so find them against the wall of their cell. Earl's just sitting on the floor, and she is kind of in his arms on his waist. They're just talking. Quite frankly, I don't remember. I think that scene was so um, amazing to me. I honestly don't remember much about it other than the obvious. So I guess I'll just skip what happens. So, you know, they're sitting there. Chia's in his arms, sitting at his waist and everything. And eventually, Earl decides that he wants to comfort her more, a little more. Uh, so he puts his hands on her shoulders, starts giving her a back rub. I guess working on her shoulders first, technically. And he just starts generally talking about stuff like F-Zero. Chia, um, I mean, he's obviously just trying to keep things from being awkward while he massaged her. He didn't want to just start sounding like some pervert or anything. He didn't want to start saying, wow, you have nice shoulders, baby. Um, no. No, he just started talking about F-Zero and stuff while he started rubbing on her. And at this point, she was out of her princess uniform. She's back in her just gray shirt and stuff, so... She was a little, um, she was a little shocked at first, and, uh, she responded to his questions and stuff, but, I mean, obviously, she was a little, uh, distracted at what was happening. So that wasn't really, um, he kept asking her F-Zero stuff, you know, as they talked, he just kind of gradually started getting lower and stuff. He wasn't doing anything sexual, but... Chia kind of brought that upon themselves, because she soon starts kind of moaning, obviously showing signs of pleasure and stuff. I would almost say, if you want to look at it in a sexual way, that may have been my hint that she is becoming turned on, but this isn't exactly that. Oh, I mean, I've done that before in the story, obviously, at the chapter with the, uh, the 
okay, you know, she got turned on like twice, I think, but um, I know like that, so you could, I guess you could argue that, yeah, she got maybe turned on a little, and uh, then she was pretty certain that this was meant to go somewhere, she thought, and here's another romantic scene, maybe, maybe I'll expand on what I was talking about last time, so she takes a shot in the dirt and she grabs the bottom of her shirt and starts lifting it up. She just kind of wants to see what rolls question her motives or anything, so she automatically assumed that, yeah, this is, this is happening. So she took her shirt off. Um, she didn't just go right to the bra or anything, obviously. She, she, she was kind of moving up there, so she takes her shirt off. She's only her black bra, and she, um... be careful because I'm in a public place now. <laughs> so she then just lays her head back against her old guy and she's now shirtless but she has her top on. So she then uh, tells Earl, requests that he continues. So she, he does. So she kind of, it was a win there. She did get what she wanted for the most part. He then starts massaging her more but now I think he's getting more down to her back actually. Um, she uh, continues to kind of moan a little and stuff. I think a little... Oh, no, they talk about their... And Earl compliments her skin a little, because he kind of... He's got kind of... This is kind of also me. What I find perfect about a girl I really love is when they have soft skin and really... Really, uh, I don't know how to explain it. I like long-haired girls, so when they have this certain, really perfectly brushed, nothing's messy, it's just perfectly straight and lined, I really, really like that. So that's kind of where Earl's thing came from. So Earl kind of, he kind of has this little uh, expectations of his own. He immediately finds Chia just so arousing and stuff. Her hair, because she was just beautified to look like a princess and all that, basically, so. And he's also rubbing against her smooth skin, so. Yeah, he's, he's a little, uh, he's a little taken back by all of this, and then he starts kind of joining in with Chia's little perverse desires, and starts talking about her skin and everything. But Chia explains a few things about her family, all having smoother skin like that, and Somewhere along the lines, Chia does just kind of ask him carefully if... You know, she, she puts her hands on her breasts, and she kind of asks if he just wants to do that. The breast massage. Uh, there's a little, uh, little dramatic talking for a bit. Earl kind of agrees. He just jump in. He's kind of questioning and stuff, they start kind of... They're a little silent with each other. They're kind of going on about how Earl would probably kill Chia just simply states in her defense, she thinks, well, in case something does go back, this is our last, the last day I'll be alive or something. Maybe, like, whoever buys me is going to kill me. Says I just like to remember my last day being something to remember. Meaning, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say she was hinting if she wanted to have sex or anything, but I mean, maybe. Guess what's ever you think. She wanted a night to remember. Uh, that night she died. She wants her last day to be something interesting. So, girl kind of agrees, and then he kind of shocks her by telling her about his intentions of if she dies and he lives. He's just going to hunt whoever killed her. And either Earl kills that person or they kill him. But he said, either way, I want 
I want to either die or I want them to die, but if I kill them, then I'm killing myself, he basically thought. Chia was kinda... No, don't kill... She was kinda like, don't kill yourself over me. And he kinda explains that his life kinda sucks and has gone downhill, he says. Without Chia, he just doesn't see how to live. And he just requests simply that she respects his desire to end his life if she dies. Obviously, this whole, um, obviously doesn't put a whole different perspective on how Chia looks at things with him, though, because now she's going to want to really stay alive. I mean, obviously you want to be alive, but now she's really going to want to be careful because she doesn't want Earl killing himself ever if she gets, like, shot to death or something. Afterwards, though, there's a little uh, silence, and finally... finally just a little uh, silence and they do end up she does end up unhooking her bra and everything she doesn't drop the bra she just unhooks it so she would drop it momentarily but the two then kind of are getting a little warm on each other girl puts his hands around her belly and stuff and then they I'm sorry I think I'm bad uh, I'll continue some bit I think my battery's about to run out <laughs> Okay, I don't think I have enough time anymore, sadly, to talk about other things, so I'm just going to speed this up and wrap up the chapter. Next time, I'll talk about other stuff. Like, I want to talk about other people's stories I've read and stuff and give a shout-out to them, but right now I'm just going to finish this up because I don't have batteries or anything, so... I'm kind of on the clock here. If it runs out, then, uh... Well, I just want to get through this whole, like, uh, sexual things. It's kind of the big thing. Anyways. So, yes, Chia and Earl now are... Her chia is now pretty much topless. She's still holding her bra up to her chest, though. Earl's, um, they're both kind of shyly kind of blushing and stuff, because you got to kind of be in Earl's shoes. You got this soft girl that's had such a hard life. She's cute. She's nice. She's your pretty much your only friend. Now you're, after a year of knowing her, you're, um, you're about to start touching her. It's probably a little, uh, <laughs> it's probably really, um, kind of emotional for Earl. I mean, this must, it must be kind of a strange feeling. So as a girl he had hit on in the bar a year ago, he was just using her once as a little, uh, just your ordinary girl. He just was hitting on her. Now he's ready to possibly have sex with her. I mean, kind of odd that they would do that, right? <laughs> Right in a cell, but I mean, I mean, Princey, I could just come back and see this happening. She'd be like, but um, Earl momentarily does move his hands up. Both are obviously then very overjoyed. But Earl's a little, I think he's just kind of like jaw dropped a little that he's actually doing it. But Chia, on the other hand, she's um, as soon as he grasps her breast bottom only. He never really went anywhere higher. He just kind of grasps the less and squeezes on the bottom of her breast and she's kind of hmm she's immediately kind of shocked and I think I I think the one thing I don't know why that little sentence was so powerful message to me. I think I wrote she then squealed in pleasure. I think the term squealed in pleasure just kind of got to me there. Yes, so that's the initial reaction she has. Earl's kind of like, this actually, I'm holding Chia's breasts. So that's kind of shocking. However, this might be the most, um, definitely, obviously, the most uh, cheerful thing in the story up to this point. I mean, this is direct romance. I really can't, I mean, I'm not supposed to comment on romance, but come on, I mean... It's not really dirty, this is obviously just two friends, finally. So, they, they do that. Now, I guess people might have been enjoying this scene a lot. I think I was not uh, sexual. I just because, just you know, after 70 chapters, I finally got to exhale and finally make something kind of happen. So I was a little excited. I wanted it to keep going, but I really couldn't do that because... Can't really 
fix mine. Just couldn't. So it had to end, unfortunately. Or all it did got to grab the bottom of her breast and get under her cleavage a little. But that's when Lily Flower come. Lily Flyer, an AX racer. Uh, she's another character that didn't, there's not much information on, so once again, I kind of had to make her in my style, even though she's not my character. I kind of created her character, sort of, personality and such. I depicted Lily as an American, kind of, who's very loudmouthed. She's kind of, she just runs into two guns and is blowing everything away. Lily's only 14, though, which is what shocks Chia and Earl. They're kind of like, uh, wait, people are, this little girl's, well, not little girl, but this girl that's like 10 years, that's 10 years younger than me is the one saving me. And Lily then kind of just escorts them through the base, blowing everything up that gets in their way. She refuses to give Chia and Earl a gun, though, saying that she needs both her SMGs. And, uh, Lily's uh, I kind of depicted her as somebody that she wore her grenades and stuff in a belt or something. So she's kind of your Boba Fett of. Maybe not Boba Fett. I don't know. It's kind of your getting a tough ass. I'll kick your ass kind of girl. So she does get them out of the temple after Princia does announce. She kind of just says, in a way, you win this round, just leave now and I'll let you go. Through the speakers, but uh. So, they eventually do get in the ship. For the most part, all is well then. She and Earl safely back on the ship. They kind of just hug and... Or no, wait, they don't hug. Or do they? I don't know. They eventually they immediately go on the couch. Seppuku, Jody, and Lily all join them momentarily. And then they introduce Lily. Seppuku, obviously. This is the first time you see Seppuku really kind of have a fondness for anybody. But yeah, he says... Lily's basically my daughter. I kind of taught her what I know, and I was in the Federation, so the intention was that, yes, Lily was kind of, I'm not saying she learned what she knew from Seppuku, but he kind of acted as a teacher. I would imagine if I was going to expand on that, it'd be a Seppuku probably watched her train a lot, gave her advice, probably helped her aim and stuff. And Lily obviously is very attached to Seppuku also, so I guess it's kind of like a father dog, even though they're not genetically related. Seppuku then tells, lets out the big secret that the reason he got Chia all the way from the start is because he wanted to see if he could turn Chia into another Lily flyer, meaning when he first found Chia being almost violated, he, want, he gave her the gun and he, she, he wanted to see if she would use it ever and become like this like killing machine like Lily. And it kind of misleads him because the next time he does see Chia was in the uh, bar in the lower city. Michael Chain had shot Seppuku there and he was unable to fight Chia still. So he was shocked though that Chia actually pulled out her gun that day and shot Chain and proceeded to drive him all the way back to his base. Even though she didn't know where it was, she had done the GPS. So that misled Seppuku. He thought, he thought, oh yeah, she had just shot this uh, big muscular gang leader. He must be like Lily Flyer, so I'll take her under my wing. Which is the big secret why she is in the organization in the first place, because at first he was so certain that this was another Lily Flyer. You know, we have to get her an F-Zero machine, got to train her. By part two, you can obviously tell that Seppuku's a little uh, drawn away from Chia at this point. He finds her annoying and stuff, because now he realizes finally, after a year, that Chia is just kind of a waste of time. And ultimately, just kind of getting in the way of progress. Not to mention, she's kind of, Earl's a good mechanic. Chia's just kind of complicating things with this relationship stuff. Kinda, Earl's probably a good worker for Seppuku at one point now. Now they're always hanging out and stuff. They're always getting emotionally attached to each other. She is always having her problems and Earl's focusing on that rather than like the Red Dove. So, anyways, Lily Flyers there. They then explain a few things, but the big uh, kind of funny joke thing, and this was my fault, so this wasn't originally supposed to be in it. What I found is that 
I looked back and I remembered something. Okay, well, let me tell you what happened. Jody and Sapuku, she just says that it was kind of uneventful in the cell. Nothing happened. Not like anything, uh. But, uh, Sapuku and Jody, I don't believe I'm just going to conclude the rest of this on my headset because I didn't feel like going and buying a $3 batteries just for, like, the conclusion because I almost had this whole thing done. But, uh, if I recall where I left off before my battery ran out is Jody and Sapuku, they began to laugh at Chia as she sat on the couch and said that nothing went on in the cell. It was a boring time, and nothing happened until Dilly came. Sapuku and Jody, they just started laughing, though. They knew this wasn't true. Oh, no. They just, um... They just started laughing at her and denying this. Chia immediately was shocked. Earl was a bit disturbed, too. And momentarily, Jody, uh, Jody, I think, puts her, she gets up to Chia and she whispers, or she says silently to her that they know that Earl and Chia, they knew that they were kind of getting intimate with each other in the cell. Chia immediately, she just freaks out and jumps up, surprised at Seppuku and demands how they know. Sapuku then, and this was clever actually, Sapuku um, tells him that they heard the entire thing because the dress Chia had been wearing had a wire in it because they were listening to the dinner before. And that was a mistake on my part because I didn't think that through at all, that's true, because there was a wire inside Chia's dress the entire time, and it's not like it broke or anything. She had to dress in the cell right next to the two, so... Yeah, I mean, Jody and Sabuku probably were just tuned in the entire time listening to them. And I didn't even know that until the end when it just came across my mind. So right in the end, I was like, oh, well, I forgot about that. It has a wire. I guess I'll have to do something with that. So, that's how Sabuku and Jody figured it out. She is immediately pretty embarrassed. I imagine she turned red and probably... Well, she fell back down onto the couch. Her all kind of face-palmed and turned red in embarrassment. He obviously didn't want anybody to know that he groped Chia, but... Kind of out in the open at this point. Everybody then kind of starts laughing at Chia, and she keeps defending herself, saying, like... Hey, it was just a moment of... Comfort and stuff. There was nothing sexual about it. She, she just kept implying, No, you thought we were going to die, so we just kind of went at it. Nothing really happened. And, you know, everybody's still laughing at her. Lily eventually, she, Lily doesn't know exactly what happened because she wasn't, she was probably working on rescuing them at the time. She just simply kind of states awkward. She immediately kind of gasped at that and said, No, it's not awkward. But, uh, at this point, everybody's pretty much just laughing at the misfortune of Chia. She's pretty scared that now that Earl's going to dislike her or something, because this is kind of her fault for seducing him. Though she's very relieved to see that underneath his hands, he is laughing as well. So, <laughs> the uh, moment kind of just turned into a big joke for everybody. Chia eventually, with still a look of embarrassment, she joined in and laughed too. Everybody now found this pretty funny. And, uh, as my golden reader, Brittany Topaz, otherwise known as Royale, would tell you, she said that, yeah, I'm probably going to expand on what happened in this chapter, and uh, yes, I would definitely expect this to be a recurring uh, thing in the story now, because this was kind of huge. Chapter ends, though. I kind of think I picked a bad time to put this in, but the conclusion to the chapter was that... Jody kind of finally just looks at Chia, and she kind of just shakes her head like, this girl's not a criminal. She's so sweet and nice and funny, and Jody kind of, she's convinced, I mean, she's not really, you know, she doesn't like Seppuku or anything still. They're pretty much bitter enemies still, but Jody just kind of looks at Chia, and she's like, this girl can't be bad. She's, she just can't, so she finally kind of just gives up on that idea, and she wants to know, so she finally just offered, makes an offer to Chia. 
Well, not really an offer, because she's kind of saying it in an enforcement way, but... She makes an offer that she'll, if Chia answers her this question, she'll ally the Federation, well, all ally with Chia, Captain Falcon, and Sapuka in the Grand Prix against Blood Falcon, Brock Blazkowicz, the Skull. And this alliance is critical because the Federation, I mean, you have Rick Wheeler, Dr. Stewart, Dr. Clash, Mr. Ed, Jody Summer. Got all these, uh, Familiar faces, that's a lot of racers that'd be helping them. I mean, how would uh, how would the bad guys even touch Chia in this case if they had all these racers guarding her? The question, however, isn't necessarily an easy one. The question, after 70 chapters, which finally, this is where he finally at long last got to hear what Chia did on Mysteria, is Jody simply asks her with a straight finger, says, Name of the Galactic Federation, answer me this. Chia Flower, why did you kill your father? That's exactly where the chapter ends, and that's the big little thing, is that what happened... I can't really say anything yet, because that would spoil lap 39, but that is the truth. What the big secret is Chia has is that she did kill her dad. Not, not the bombs. And we'll... See what happens in Lab 39. It's been a long time. I honestly had no idea I would ever get this far. I, I had this idea for a long time that the whole kill your father thing, but um, I didn't think I was actually going to continue a story this far, so I'm surprised I've actually made it this far. But yep, it's finally after 70, maybe even 80 chapters, I don't know. Finally made it. Now you finally are going to get to learn what happened on Mysteria, how Chia ended up on Mute City, why she's such a dark girl, and why she's so sad. Now, um, one thing I'll tell you, that was kind of stupid of me to put this ending in this chapter, because I can't just... I mean, I think it's fine, but seriously, I mean, anybody should probably be able to agree with me. You can't just throw something so sexual and emotional and amazing as that whole, uh sell uh, thing between Chia and Earl. You can't just throw that in a chapter. Then just throw this whole kill your father thing above that. That's a little it's throwing a little too much at the audience, I think, but I really just didn't see that I, I knew this was the chapter a long time ago, the one where they were locked up. I knew this was where I wanted it to be revealed. But it kinda got complicated because I added that whole sexuality thing in it, but I don't regret it. I think this chapter turned out pretty awesome, actually. I I like it more, though, just because of how romantic it was. And I don't know, you really can't... One could argue, I suppose, that maybe... I guess you could argue whether this whole occurrence between Chia and Earl with the topless stuff and the groping... This could either be out of love could be out of just perverseness. Maybe it's just for comfort. I don't know. That's literally up to the reader. I kind of... I like to think, personally, if you honestly want my opinion, but do not establish that this is it. I do think this was probably, ultimately, a sign of affection between the two, but that's certainly not what I'm saying it is. I'm saying that's what I think it is. And... I view, I think I myself am kind of like a reader. I don't always know what's up ahead in a story, so I'm basically just as clueless on what's going to happen as any of you are. So, I mean, view it as you may. Love, perverseness. Hey, going on. Big chapter, though. I don't really, um... I gotta be kind of careful with that, though. I think it was, I don't really regret what I did, but it's kind of, considering I do label this as a non-mature story, I feel, I feel I need to be careful, because this is obviously kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel now. I can't just keep risking it like that. Eventually, I might just give myself a band off fan fiction or deviant art if I keep this up, so. I gotta be careful. My problem, though, is I don't want to just, I don't want to, make one chapter mature content, but the rest not. And I certainly don't want to make them all mature content, or else I'm not getting any views. 
So that's a really tough one. I would hope that people would be mature enough and not just report it or anything, because it's not like I'm showing it. It's just written text. You don't read it. If. If you're scared, you'll be offended. And I always put in the description, this has sexual themes, swearing, violence. So I would hope that's just enough for people to understand. But I understand there is a such thing as people who literally go hunting for this stuff just to be a jerk and report this stuff. I would understand now the comic suit when I do want to start writing the little manga for this. That, I'm afraid, as much as many will hit, I am probably going to just put mature content in all of them, but only because those are pictures now. And the story can get very bloody, dirty, sexual. <sighs> well, I'm sorry, though. This one was supposed to be a big... <laughs> This was supposed to be a big, just general purpose talk, but this ended up just being a really detailed summary from the author's perspective of Lap 38. Next time, I'll probably talk about more, but I just... I don't like talking here on my microphone. Maybe you like when I do. I kind of don't. I like taking my walks and talking because I can think better. But, um, I don't... God damn it. I don't know where, um, don't know when I will, this, this is a pretty stretched out video, I'll admit, so I don't know how I'm supposed to put more room in for other stuff, but what I want to do is I want to just talk about other stuff, maybe some other chapters, I even want to talk about some of the stories I've, re I've read from other users, which, uh, I think the first one I would talk about is, I believe it's called Mute Herald by the Shadow Master. I was very impressed with that story. I haven't read it since August. But I established that I'll start reading it again sometime in December. I'll talk about that sometime, though. I'm sure the creator doesn't mind me giving a shout-out for their story since... I'm kind of advertising it for them. But, um... Yeah, I think the first story I'll talk about is Mute Herald. I think I maybe I should probably read it over again if I'm going to do a little review on it. But oh, and lastly, I don't know um, how often I'll make these. I think it's just I might if I think a chapter's way too important, like critical to the story. I think I'll go grab my camera and do this. But I'd much prefer just doing this during the weekend. So. I would expect if it's a chapter that's like really getting to your heart and stuff, like this one was pretty emotional and amazing to a few people, so some people are actually pretty offended by this, because a lot of people actually don't like the idea of Chia and Earl getting together, they think it ruins the story. Sorry, but no. Romance is a critical component of any one of my stories, so if you don't like the romance, then don't read it. Like, I need, I want fans, and any kind of fans, but seriously, I mean, I'm not just going to submit and stop. So, anyways, as I said, I think the most important chat, like, for example, the finales, any finale, I'm probably going to definitely make one of these little recordings on, but this was just too big of a chapter to let go, I thought. It was a golden idol for the... Golden chapter for the cheer all fans. So. Anyway, that's about it really then. I think I'll conclude this. And say goodbye. I don't know when the next time I'll make one of these is again. I'll just, um. We'll see. I'd like preferably do this during a weekend. So, goodbye.